Kind Earth Tech. A taste of the future. I'm very, very glad that someone like Dan, who is so knowledgeable about this and worked so hard on uh, this to happen, is willing to come here on stage today and talk about what cultivated meat actually tastes like. So please, Dan, will you join the stage? And thank you for being patient with us. So like Ira said, my name is, is Dan Leuning. Uh, I'm the founder and CTO of Meatable. Um, so what we do at Meatable is that we are making meat, real meat from animal cells. So I started Meatable about three years ago after I was uh, an academic, a researcher, and was part of the team of Mark Post that developed the uh, laboratory grown hamburger back in 2013. Uh, and afterwards, I moved through this journey to become a research director of New Harvest, which is a nonprofit in this space, uh, and then developed a fellowship program in that space so that people all around the world could participate in this field and add their knowledge and add their passion to make cultivated meat a reality. But that's not what I'm here today to talk about. So one of the things, of course, I, I love is to talk about Meetable, but also now I want to tell you a bit more my experience coming from the molecular biologist on uh, realizing what it means to make food using uh, molecular biology, and then especially around the taste, the flavor, the texture, all these things. But quickly, I think a lot of people know about already about cultivated meat, but I do like to emphasize what our mission is, is that we are trying to satisfy the world appetite for meat without harming uh, people, animals and the planet. And it's so important at the moment. It is more important than ever that we're trying to diversify, that we're trying to find alternatives to actual meat. Since at dinner tonight, I was, I was eating uh, a piece of meat and I was realizing how much I enjoy it. And unfortunately, I'm not the only one who enjoys it. People really love to do this. Uh, they really, really like to share food together, have the experience together, really think about uh, what dinner they make. And usually meat is at the center of this process. Uh, always when you go to a restaurant at the center of your plate, there is a piece of meat that people just find delicious. And um, there's a big problem with all these people consuming so much of this product. So what you can see here is the desire from people to eat meat. These are just four graphs and just in, in summary, you can see it going up. Every, every graph that you see here has a trajectory of more. So what you can see is uh, the amount of meat that we produce, the amount of meat that we consume from pig meat to poultry to beef, uh, the, how much meat is consumed in the US compared to China. Uh, and what you see here is that the richer countries become, the more animal proteins they digest. And this is in the left bottom corner. This was really striking for me. When you look at the GDP per country and the amount of animal or meat that they consume yearly, um, it just goes, it, there's a stark correlation here. So as soon as people come out of poverty and they have the opportunity to diversify their diet, it's the first thing they do. And we should try to make sure that we're not eating ourselves to death. This is very important because there's more people coming and the way that we are growing meat now is not going to uh, be sustainable for the future. So we have to innovate. And this is the vision that Meatable has for that innovation. So we're taking the animal out of the equation while we're still using the fundamental building blocks of these animals. We're still taking the cells of the animals and we put this in an environment where they can thrive and they can grow uh, until the point that we can harvest them and then turn them into muscle and fat. And this is a render that we have. So this is really the dot on the horizon. Uh, 2025 seems far away, but we're already working towards this where we can have such factories where there's a clean environment, where there's a safe environment, where people can uh, decide what to eat, what type of species they want to eat, what type of meat they want to create. And then uh, this is an overview on what type of stages goes on inside of such a process. And what I like to do is look at this map and take you along with it and then tell you on which points in this innovation journey we can have an influence on the flavor, on the texture, uh, on the smells that come eventually from the end product, from the packaging, the storage and the distribution. 
So it all starts with a cell bank. So we take a little bit of cells from an animal, and this can be any animal. Um, eventually, we want to do seafood, we want to do terrestrial animals, and but we store these cells. We store them for later use to make sure as there's an order coming in and people ask for a very uh, specific type of meat they want to eat. They want to have, for example, a Belgian blue steak. We take from the fridge, we take a sample that we got from these Belgian blue cows, and we start to bring them back alive. We put them inside of the sea train. And this is a small environment where we can take care of the cells very closely and we are making them comfortable and start to multiply into a, a bigger space. And once they have grown enough, we take them into a little bit more space till eventually we reach the point where we're gonna put them in a big bioreactor system. And a bioreactor is nothing more than a, a basically a fermentation tank, similar to ones that you can imagine uh, brewing beer in. But now we are taking these animal cells and placing them in this environment where you can see underneath where we have the amino acids, the vitamins, the salts, and the glucose or the sugar that normally a person or an animal would eat, but only now broken down in the fundamental blocks that the cells can readily easily absorb and then start to multiply into more cells. So eventually, if we have enough of these cells, then is where uh, the magic of Meetable happens. This is where we are turning the cells into muscle and fat. And this is very important because here is a really one of the key things where we can influence uh, taste and flavor. I will be talking to that in a little bit. One of the things I also like to focus on uh, for my presentation here is hanging of the meat. So this is also called beef aging. And this was an area for me that was pretty unknown. I didn't realize that if you slaughter a, a cow and you eat the meat fresh, it won't taste nice. There is a process that is called hanging or aging that it needs to go through before the right flavors are created that we expect from a piece of beef. And this is a unique process which was completely unknown to me and also the process behind it, like really from a molecular level. But I educated myself because I realized if we want to create the real deal, if we want to create a product that which is 100% real delicious meat, we need to start thinking about this process too. So here you can see on which parts of this process we can interact with uh, the flavor and the, and the texture. So during the bioreactor phase, we can determine on how much fat we are going to grow, on muscle cells we're going to grow, what species we're going to grow the cells from, and what ratio eventually we're going to end up with. But this is really just the, the bulk amount of cells that we're going to eventually turn into something delicious. So only the choices of species and types of cells are made here to make sure that the eventual end product ends up with the right ratio of whatever we thought in the beginning we would like to make. Next to it is what we call the tissue downstream. So here is where the muscle and the fat tissue is actually created. So the cells before were basically a blank slate. We call this a pluripotent state or a stem cell. And then over in the next phase, we differentiate them into muscle and fat. And this is such a unique moment that we have in this process. Since before you have uh, you had an animal that you can feed either grass or soy or corn, and of course this has an influence on the eventual taste. But eventually you're, you you cannot unlimitedly diversify in the diet of a cow. It has very specific needs of what it wants to eat and what it can eat. But now in our process we can. We can tweak anything we want. We can add extra vitamin D, for example, for a personalized piece of steak for people with uh, low sunlight environments, which we're experiencing right now in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, we can have added nutrients for high protein content. So we can really determine what type of things eventually end up in this product. Uh, saturated and unsaturated fat is a thing that we can determine. So this is just a, 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 a peek into the future of what is possible in this process of taking a new natural way of producing meat without the need of slaughtering animals. But then the, then the part uh, which is, was really unknown for me when I started this journey is the hanging of the meat. So what happens here is that you store your meat at a very specific temperature and at this moment in time uh, certain proteins and enzymes start to work and they break down the tissue to become more tender to create also the precursors that eventually react during in the pan to make the nice flavors. So this is such an important step that I, I'd like to uh, break it down to you of what those different things are that are inside of your uh, of the of the product that you buy, like a piece of meat that you buy, that it let you experience 
uh, the flavors that come from them. And there are roughly saying, since you know, you can you can debate a little bit about this, but there are roughly three uh, sections that you can determine on uh, the interaction with your with your tongue and with your nose. And one of them, of course, is taste. So there are sweet, salt, uh, acidic, bitter, and umami. And uh, uh, the biggest joke I, when I found this out is that I've been taught in school that your tongue has different types of tasting areas. And later on in life, I learned that this was uh, basically bogus. Uh, in 1901, there is a paper published that described a minute difference between little parts of your tongue, but this was com taken completely out of context. And actually, your tongue is roughly overall similar in taste experience. Uh, so really thinking that there's different areas in the tongue is definitely not true. And I tried to break this spell, but for some reason has perpetuated throughout the educational system and throughout just the lore that people like to tell each other. But please believe me that this is not true. Your entire tongue is able to taste all the five different uh, tastes that it, can, uh, that it can experience. So where do these uh, sensations come from? If you add something to your tongue, where does this sensation come from? And you can roughly separate them in four different categories, which is amino acids, which come from proteins. And so certain amino acids have certain flavors and it will activate different types of reactions on your tongue. There's of course sugars and not every sugar has the same type of reaction. Uh, some sugars have an extreme reaction. Um, so then yet you can taste the sweetness and people are very good at tasting sweetness. This is a thing that through evolution we have developed to really uh, localize what nutrient sources are rich in sugar since it was uh, such a scarce product when, you're, uh, uh, when you need to survive. The other thing are nucleotides and nucleotides is nothing more than the building blocks of DNA. So every cell has this, every product that you uh, that you buy has this, and nucleotides can actually uh, bring a very complex flavor with it. For example, if you uh, get a yeast fermentation and you can steer it in a direction that it produces a very particular type of nucleotide sequence, this will make it taste like chicken. So nucleotides are also very important for taste. And of course, the final one, which is basically just an umbrella an umbrella term that we use for fats, since there are so many different fats, which meet so many different f flavors. Fats can range from the most delicious, uh, like glutaric acid that people really enjoy to eat. You can really the tasty ones, still the ones that oxidizes and also give the uh, smell of what we call rancid. So fats has this duality of worlds that brings together a lot of flavor, but also potential for oxidation, a lot of nasty flavors. But all these things combined will give you the perception of taste. And humans are amazing taste machines. So the right balance between these four components will give you a realization and you can distinguish through that certain types of food. You can immediately tell when something is off. So the balance between these things has to be just right. But it, of course, taste is just one of the senses that we use uh, in tasting something or in, in, in the flavor that we're experiencing. And the other one, of course, which is much more complex. And to be honest, there's, there's less known about the complexity of this system than taste is, but it is so important because it's much more variable. There's much more combinations possible, uh, which is the smell. So your nose is a unique organ in your body that has the nerve endings run through uh, your part of the brain that is associated with memories. So that's why if you uh, smell a very particular smell, it reminds you of grandma's house. It reminds you of that summer night that you were spending on holidays in this uh, at a uh, on a holiday destination. So smell is so important, and smell can be. Uh, can come from so many complex molecules. So what we call this, these are key reaction compounds. So these are not necessarily single compounds, which they can be, but they can also be a complex mixture of uh, different compounds that bind together, that fall apart, uh, that react on certain temperatures. This is what we call the Maillard reaction. Uh, the Maillard reaction is, is a rea chemical reaction that happens at 140 degrees Celsius and is the most delicious chemical reaction that you can think of. It's the reason why we bake our case, cakes at 180 degrees Celsius. It's the point where sugars and uh, proteins are combined together and this gives a nice crispy golden layer. Uh, so this is a, a reaction that humans really love, especially when you add a lot of butter and flour. This is, of course, when the when the magic happens when you're when you're making cakes, and, and humans just love this. Also, when you bake 
uh, meet the golden brown reaction that you see in the outside is the, is the, uh, the outcome of the Maillard reaction. And the last one, and this is, this is a very different one since it, it doesn't have to do with what we normally perceive with typical flavor compounds, what is texture. And people have been trying to measure texture with machines, but there is no, nothing, there's nothing uh, compared to the human experience on when you're trying to perceive texture. So the way that you bite into something, the crispiness, the softness, the way that it breaks down, how fibrous it is, how tender it is, is pretty much unique to every single product that you eat. If you eat a potato chip and you first have a bite, it's very crispy. But then the breakdown profile tells you how crispy it is. So it becomes less, it becomes more mushy over time, and then it becomes mushy enough to swallow. If this would be off, if you would have a potato chip that would stay as crispy as the first bite, you would freak out. You would say there's something wrong with this potato chip. But also after a night you leave, leave the bag of chips open and you take one, it's still, you can taste it. It has, it is, it's not as tender, not as crispy as it used to be. Because people can sense the very minute differences in these types of things. Water holding content is nothing more this, uh, this, uh, described as the amount of water and there's like the, the moistness of something that you bite into. But especially when it comes to meat, this is, this is very, very important. So the things that play into this experience are the fats and muscle cell ratio. You can have very fatty meat, which probably will be more oily and have a different experience when you bite into it. The muscle fibers. So muscle consists out of muscle fibers and how thick they are and how many of these are around will also determine water holding content, but also fibers and breakdown profile together with tenderness. So this is very, very important since muscle tissue is almost 90% muscle cells. So the fiber formation plays a key part in how we experience texture. The water percentage is very important in meat since if it's too dry, people don't like it. If it's too watery, people think it will taste weird. And so this all has to do also with thickness. If you have very thin slices of meat, it has an influence. If you have very thick part of tissue, it's very influent. So all these things, so the taste, the smell, and the texture, will eventually will have to work in harmony and be 100% um, comparable to meat to let people experience that and say, ah, I'm actually eating meat. And what is unique about what we're doing using the cells of an animal is that we actually are making meat. So a lot of what a lot of these things that you see on the bottom uh, in the slide actually already comes from uh, comes from the the cells that we use and the tissue that we're making. One thing um, I like to give I would like to tell you today, which wasn't known for me at least, but maybe people are much smarter than me in the audience already knew about this, is that you don't necessarily only need protein amount. So that's, this is what you can get anywhere, right? You can get plant so. proteins, you can get insect proteins, you can get proteins if you want them. But what is really important for the experience of eating meat is a variation. What type of proteins are in there? Are there bovine muscle cell proteins in there? Are there enough bovine muscle cell proteins in there? And having this up to par is really important, especially for hanging of the meat. Since the deterioration profile of these proteins will determine what flavors will be created during the Maillard reaction. So it's both protein amount and variation, which is important. And the same goes for fat. It's fat amount and fat variation. So one of the things I already told you about is the muscle fiber formation, but to assist the cells in creating this thick tissue, like the real strong muscle or like a, a nice steak formation that we, that we want to achieve, is that we have to assist them with the use of a scaffold. And a scaffold material is nothing more than a uh, either a mesh of proteins or a substitute protein that holds the cells together to create the, the, the thick tissue to get a 3D environment where the cells can fuse together in this nice mu muscle fibers. And that will eventually have a taste too. So we need to be very careful what we use for this and how it's been broken down and how the cells react to this because all these things will finally end up in the Maillard reaction and we'll have a reaction together. So if there's something off, which uh, a lot of people at Givodan told is called off flavors, people will know. People will know and it won't be nice to eat. So this is very, very important that we get this right. Uh, and I already, I think I told you about the Maillard yeah. reaction, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, Ira. <laughs> Hello, Dan. Um, can I ask you to wrap it up from here? Yeah, it's, it's, it's two minutes. we need it's you really, to go really... to the breakout. Great. Yeah, it's two Thank minutes. Thank you.
I will, I will, I will skip then the the, the Myar reactions, the proteins and glucose and heat, <laughs> and then for me it's the last part. Of what I said is the, the hanging of the meat. Uh, this is very important because if you don't do this right, you'll get nasty types of meat. And here you can see examples of that. So you need to make sure that the pH is right. Else you get, you know, the either sides. It's very narrow with the pH. But this is one thing that we're currently really considering and thinking about. So uh, please uh, realize that we're taking this into account. We're using all these nice technologies and all these uh, amazing people that working for us to achieve this uh, very soon oh, and nice. make sure that uh, eventually we'll end up with something like <laughs> this, which we created in 2020, uh, 2021, which is our, our first prototype product, which was a pork sausage. So thank you. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I was making this so long, but I really, really <laughs> love talking about this topic. I, Dan, I love it.